OK, so one thing you can do is go to Project and then Clean Up Project Files. And then click on that. It's going to have a lot of these, you know, these compiled XE figures. And if you click OK, then it'll get rid of all the uh, iSIM and uh, compiling uh, and things that you you need. Um, and then you can just go back and actually just simulate the behavior model. So it's possible that there was some issue with that. But I, I would uh, find a time. Uh, who, who else has encountered that issue? So I have two. Okay, so I have two people who've encountered that issue. I would like to see that. So we'll find some time to go into the lab, mm -hmm. and we will look at it. And I'll figure out what the issue is, and try to go from there. In terms of trying to fix it. Yes, Adam. Another thing I kept doing is, like, I would go and try to make a test bench mm -hmm. for one of the modules. Like, exactly the same way that I've done all the other ones. And instead, it would pull up a page that said test bench template at the top, but looked different than all the others. And then it would crash my files. Like, it would say that the okay. files would like, shut down. So you do like the normal thing. So you go to file. Uh, I'm sorry. You would go here. You would click on uh, new source, VHDL test bench, and we'll go uh, generic here. And then you would pick like 16 to look 16 to one or something like that. Right. And then. And right when I hit finish, there it would pop up and it would say something about an XSC file moving that had uh, that apparently was important. Yeah, because that's the actual uh, file that it's <laughs> running off of for the actual project itself. So, hmm, I'll need to see that too. That would shut down the whole program. I have to restart it. Hmm. Usually I couldn't pull anything out of that. So, what are these two errors? Oh, OK. Yeah, that's not a big deal. OK, so we were go. Uh, well, I want to go to that later. All right, so I want to. Uh, when I see, I actually have a meeting right after this lecture today. Um, to, uh, but later in the afternoon, I can go into the lab and take a look at that and see if we can reproduce those errors and then try to fix the problem. Um, for those of you who downloaded it on Windows 7, did you uh, encounter any issues? I think on your own personal computer, did you encounter any issues like that? Okay. So, so the next question is, for those of you who didn't encounter any issues, uh, along those lines. What were some of the other hindering factors in stopping you from submitting the assignment? Yeah, just uh, like 2.10 and 2.11. I kind of like had to hit the, well, I was on 2.10 and I was like, I don't try to figure out how to do a 16 to 1. Right. And then turn around from that day to a 3 to 1 and I kind of had an issue with that. So. Okay, so now you're trying to build, um, so you're trying to do your issues in terms of so you have your 16 to 1 design, and you have 2 to 1 designs, and you're trying to figure out how to... Well, I, well I didn't even get to, like, I mean, what's 2 to 1? Right now I had, like, trouble just trying to get the 16 to 1 down and then connect to the 2 to 1. So, I had, well, I didn't, I didn't connect the 16 to 1 much yet. Okay. So I was, like, trying Why are you to trying to connect? I'm not, I'm, I hope I'm not coming off as uh, condescending. I'm, I'm trying to ask you why you're connecting a 2 to 1 to a 16 to 1. Well, that's what it's... Uh, I want you to build... 16 and ones out of the. Oh, okay. So that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, because you. Okay. okay. So this is so this is what I wanted to go into. Uh, yeah. What? Um. The. Today I wanted to cover uh the end here in section three. First things first. Before that, I want to go a little into this problem because I think this kind of ties into what we're doing since we're going into two to one muxes. Uh, I was told there's some issues with the YouTube clip, um, concerning. Example 2.6 and 2.7 through 2.9 in terms of the size, I guess. Um, so, but this is a, an important one because I want to go over what I'm expecting. So here we're basically using the two to one multiplexer to do additional designs, right? So you could actually the, the solution to this problem with everything that you have in VHDL, you could actually go in and test it and see that it works, right? 
So the whole idea of this problem is I'm going to give you on, on the exam, which is a week from today, by the way, I'm going to give you a truth table because this will be easier than doing an equation concerning time. And I'm going to say, I want you to design the circuit using two to one multiplexer. Now what this means is I'm going to want you to get to something like this. This is the goal. We're going to have an input circuit and then you're going to have that as a multiplexer. So we can use multiplexers in, in different ways. You can use multiplexers to build from a 2 to 1 mux. And if you have three 2 to 1 muxes, you can build to a 4 to 1 mux, right? So then if you have a 4 to 1 mux, you can then build to 16 to 1 muxes, right? So then the, and how many 4 to 1 muxes would you need for that? Four. So then what, what am I? So I have four 16 to 1 muxes. Or four 4 to 1 muxes, right? And then, so you have the 16 inputs going to the four, four to one boxes, right? <laughs> so then you have those two control signals, but what's on the outputs? Yeah, we have what, what, So then what's on the outputs of those four? How many signals do I still have? Four. And so what am I trying to, what's my goal? What's my design goal? To get down to one, correct? So what do I, so if I have four signals, I'm trying to get down to one, what do I want to do? <laughs> Four to one. There you go. Now you guys are doing engineering. Okay, so that's kind of, and this is a point I want to touch on. I got a lot of emails. People say, is it acceptable for me to break it into blocks where I'm designing four to one multiplexers or eight to one multiplexers to build a 16 to one box? Yes. You are electrical engineering students, right? So I want you to do some engineering. Design. Have fun. Right? Part of Part of it is being creative and trying to figure out this process. You don't have to ask me for permission, right? So that, that was one thing I wanted you to address. So, um, yeah. Um, when we're trying to, we're going to talk about the vector quantities. Like, yes. Okay, then I'll, then I'll just keep walking. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so I want to go over that in a bit here. Um, so I'll go over this example question. So what I'm asking for in this question, you're going to use a two to one mux to try to perform Shannon expansion. So what, sh what is Shannon expansion? Since, we're, since you guys were able to read that on the TGL. What's the, what's the, what's the idea behind Shannon expansion? And how does it multiply? Uh, you can combine phrases. Actually, the end of the Shannon expansion is off the page. Yeah. OK, so the whole idea behind Shannon expansion is that you are, you have a, this, like for this example, this question has three variables, right? And Shannon expansion is a, is a theorem that states that if you do Shannon expansion around one of the variables, where one, where one set is the variable is equal to zero and the other is the variable is equal to one, it breaks down into sub-functions. So if, a is equal to zero, then your output function is going to be a function of B and some sort of function of B of C. And if the output is one, it's going to be a different function. For example, in the solution here, if we do Shannon expansion about the variable A, right? What we've discovered is by doing this K map where we are limiting ourselves to go away. Sorry. If we are limiting ourselves to doing Shannon expansion about A, what this means is that when A is zero, we're getting some, we're get, this is one and this is one, correct? So we have zero, zero, and one, zero, right? So whenever it's C bar, that's our function when is A is equal to zero. Now when A is equal to one, like it is here, we have one, one, run, right? That means we look up here and we see that our, what's our function when A is equal to one? Based B or C, right? So there, so the idea behind Shannon's expansion is if you pick a variable to do Shannon expansion about, if it's zero, you will have some function. And if it's one, you will have some other function. And this will always be the case. That's the, that's the idea behind the theorem, right? So what I'm asking you to do is I'm going to give you three variable functions just like this. 
will be very similar. And I want you to do, in order to get full credit, you're going to do three K maps. You're going to do one where the Shannon expansion is around variable A, like this, right? You're going to do one where the Shannon expansion is about variable B, and you're going to do one where the Shannon expansion is about variable C. So that's what I've done here. And then based on that, you're going to figure out the function for each of these. So here, B naught, we're going to have these. So it's going to be A naught, C naught, or A C. Right? Now, you could do A X or C naught, right? That's an equivalent function. And here, for B, it's 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 0. So this becomes A or C naught, right? And based on that, the, and then for the, the expansion around about C, you're going to use the truth table to derive this K map. And if it's around C naught and C, you get A naught B, because this is A naught. That's one, and then one and one here, so it's going to be A naught or B, and you can do that by doing the P sub cubes. So does this make sense so far? You said that you choose one variable, so it's a birthday about. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you chose, just for the first example, you said C prime. Yes. Why would your, it was A prime, C prime, why is it C prime? B, okay, so. I see it's in the like the A prime row, and that's where you got it. Right, so it's A prime here, right? Mm -hmm. And so your K map, you see this is 0, 0, and 1, 0, right? Mm -hmm. that and have so the, the, the B would, the B changes, so you take it out, and it's C prime. Yeah, because what it is, it's going to be B naught, C, or, I'm sorry, B naught, C naught, right? Mm -hmm. This is 0, 0 here, correct? And this one is B, C naught. So you can use De Morgan reduction, it just becomes uh, yeah, C naught. So the trick that I that you can use is you see how if you look at what's common, you see how the zeros, the second zero is what's in com what's common for both of them, right? So that's how you just make it C naught. Would you do the next one the A? Sure. Okay. So about B? So for Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so you see that the, the so you look for ones in common. So you do the P sub cube here as a first one. And what's in common between those? C. C, that is correct. So that's how this showed up. And so we do a second P sub cube here, right? And what's in common with those? So it becomes B or C. So we just ignore like cross from yeah, the reason why is because we're doing Shannon expansion. So you're going to do just the rows like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why uh, somebody was asking me last week why I was doing it this way, even though it's because I was setting up for this specific problem. Yes? In uh, the previous class, we, we talked about the essential priming uh -huh. And So with that one there at uh, ABC, for the first example, would that not be an essential prime implicate? Which one? Uh, the value A, B, C, so A1, A111. 111? No, that, it's not, that's not an essential prime implicate because the idea behind an essential prime implicate is that it has to be uniquely covered by one of the P subcubes. Okay. So in this case, 101, or 110 because it's A, B, C. This is an essential prime, this is as well, this is as well. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the idea behind essential is it has to be essential, meaning that it can't be covered by another one. Okay. So that's okay. So does everybody understand how I got this? So then for B, for uh, yeah, for B. Mm -hmm. So you only circled like the one there mm -hmm. under zero zero. Yep. And then zero one one. Is that because we want to? Uh, we're doing the Shannon's expansion, so we want to make sure that we have uh, that B prime there. Bingo. Yeah, you want it exactly right. Does everybody understand what he just said? Yeah. So, and so for, let me do this. I'm going to cover up that so you don't know the answer. 
All right, so based on B naught, what is my value there? Bingo, that's exactly right. And then what about this one? In fact, I'm going to cover these as well. So. Yep, exactly right. So now you see how to make the reduced version. You just look for what's in common. You look for the patterns based on the P sub Q. Okay, for C, I know I'm covering up the answer, but I want you guys to actually work through it because you're going to be doing this next next week. So how? what about C, pr C prime? C bar. What what's the going to be the equation, other than you can see it? Look at look at look at this and figure it out, because you won't have this on the exam. Yeah. So the this this p sub cube is a prime, and then the second sub cube is b. So exactly right. And so what about this one here? A. So bingo. So it's going to be a. So from there. Now we're going the next step is give me the cost. So what's the what is what's the cost of this? So it's going to be literal is 1, right? The gate cost is 1 because we have one literal and one gate, right? And then the inversion is 1. Does that make sense? So we don't we don't so no, no, you do not. And the reason why, remember the input cost earlier? We're going to get to the solution down here. We're just using the two to one multiplexer to design it. So the whole idea is, I and, the, and these, this is a comparison. You're only going to be asked to do one of these. Um, but what I'm doing is saying, all right, you're going to design with a two to one mux. So the two to one mux is common for all three possible designs. And you're going to tell me based on this cost, which one is the better design? So, what's the value? so the so the what you've just what you're we're calculating here is the cost for what's going into the the multiplexer. So that's why. So to go off a little bit here, that's why when I say in the question, design the circuit using a two to one mux and any other necessary gates. I want to know how much the other necessary gates cost and which one's the best. Okay. All right, so covering that up, what's this cost here? So why does the uh, Yeah, L is 2, right? <laughs> Gate is gate's one. Uh oh, no, it's not. Why is it two? Because remember, what's what's this OR gate? Because mm -hmm, the OR gate is not an input. You're gonna have the two signals here as your input values. Because what happens? Look at this right here. This one down here. This is counts as a gate, and this counts as a gate. Right? See that? So this is going to be that's the, that counts the same as this and this. Those are going to count the same. Does that make sense now? So with these multiplexers, it, you got to make sure that you uh, mm -hmm. almost count the, the literals almost. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the the reason. But the literals yeah. are handed to something. They, yeah, this is for consistency because what will end up happening is if I say, I mean, that, this is also, the, I mean, it's also the correct answer. But if I say you're allowed to count that as one gate, then what's going to happen is someone's going to say, well, I can count that as one gate, and then I'm going to mark you wrong, and you're going to be sad, and you don't, you don't want that to happen. So this is for consistency. So count that as. It's a literal gate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so what's my, what's what 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 are the, what are the th so the, what's the third one we're going to calculate here? Inverters, right? So how many are there? Zero. Hmm. It's just taking us a while.
what I'm gonna de what I'm debating doing instead on the exam. I'm trying to figure out like how much because this is taking a little longer than I thought it was going to. Um, instead of having three, what I'm gonna I might have a a, a three variable input and tell you to do Shannon expansion of, about one of them. Tell me the cost and then design the circuit. I think that's what I'll do on the exam instead because I don't want to take up too much time. So let's just put, let's uh, let's make it as this as though it's three problems. Three potential exam problems. So let's do a Shannon expansion about B. What's the first step? Okay, so we're going to do a K-map, right? You're going to draw the K-map. So we've drawn our K-map here. And then what a what's going to be my so we've already done our functions. You guys if you guys understand how we got these two now, right? So now what's our cost? Let's uh I'm going to cover these up. What's our what's our literal cost? 4. What's our gate cost? 2. And what's our inverter cost? 2. So we have 4, 2 and 2. So that's 4. So that's going to become 8, right? And so you got the first one correct. Very good. And so what's our second one? Two literals, two gates, one inverter. Correct. So that's 2, 1, and 1. That's 5. And then you add them together and get 13. So we already know, based on this, that B is not going to be the solution we want, correct? We've already eliminated it. You can say, using standard expansion, I can prove this. So, part C, let's do C now. We've done our we've done our K map. You guys understand how to do that. We've done our functions. So, let's cover these up. So, what's my uh, literal cost? Two. I'm sorry, I should phrase it literal input cost. So I'm consistent. Literal input cost is what's my gate input? cost and what's my inverter cost so that becomes five and what's my gate input cost here what's, so my literal, I'm sorry my literal input cost what's my gate input cost what's my inverter cost and that becomes seven so in this case there were a tie so about a we just take our functions and we had B or C, which is what we have here, right? And then C not, so we inverted C when C was zero. And you just use the multiplexer to do that. So what I'm going to do on an exam is I'm going to give you a truth table like this. And I'm going to phrase it this way. I'm going to say, come on, come on, there you go. Given the following truth table. Design, a, design the circuit using a 2 to 1 multiplexer and any other necessary gates. Use a Carnot map to derive the input function, a route, variable A, variable B, or variable C, which one I'm going to put on the exam. Then state the total input cost of Shannon expansion around that variable. Then next, draw the circuit. And I'm, going to, I'm going to say get, I'm not going to have lowest input cost only. And then I'm going to have the same condition. Use it may, may only use and nor and nan or nor and inverter gates as the input to the MUX. And the reason why I have eliminated XOR gates is because XOR gates tend to be complicated for these people tend to on on exams people tend to that's where it's consistently screwed up. So I'm trying to eliminate errors and points lost. And also XOR gates usually are consisted of AND gates and OR gates anyway. So does that make sense? Is that a, you guys think that's a fair question? All right, that's a, good. Okay, so we went over encoders and decoders. Um, let me go down to the example question. So this is the simple one, 2.7. And so the whole idea that I'm trying to convey with this type of question is that you can use your blocks to try to reduce design. So this is a very simple version, where I just have the min terms as 2, 4, and 5, and use a 3 to 8 decoder to give me my output. Well, you have your three inputs, because it has, it's going to go up to 17, so you require A, B, and C. 
And then just use the 3D8 decoder, and you already know 2, 4, and 5 here, right? So then just use the word gates, and you have yourself a function. So this is how you use your previously designed primitives in EHDL to reduce your, the complexity of your design. So when you're working on projects later on in the course, the, the purpose is to uh, not reinvent the wheel. I should tell you that the, the, my justification for doing the BHDL this way is because usually what happens in courses is they kind of start you out real easy and then final project's a, a mess, right? So then you're spending the last two, three weeks of the semester tearing your hair out and you hate your life and then you get four projects like that all at once, right? What I was doing is I wanted you guys to build up this coding, this uh, base of code, and then come the final project, basically you're just putting the pieces together. So I'm trying to spare you trouble towards the end of the semester. So, and, I, and besides, that's a better coding fundamental anyway, in my opinion. So, and if you can do that, you're more valuable to an employer anyway. So, that's and that's the real reason that you guys are here, because you want money. Um, so let's do uh, 2.8. So here we have uh, three to eight, using three to eight decoders and two input AND gates and two or input OR gates only, design a logic circuit that implements the following function. Um, so this actually goes up to five variables, but the three to eight decoder only handles three variables, right? So what you can do is you can split this is kind of what I've done here. You split the variables into two chunks here. So you can do a three to eight decoder here, and you can do a three to eight decoder here, where you're using zero, one, two, and three. So what I've done is I've broken up into top and bottom, and given the value based on the binary code. So we had one, six, 12, 17, 27, and 31. So one is just, Zero, 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 1. So the top was 0 and the bottom was 1, right? With 6, it's the same thing, 0 and 6. So now we're up to 12. So 12 is just uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? Breaking this in, down like that, it becomes the top is 1 and the bottom is 4. Does that make sense? And now 17 is this value. So now it becomes 1, 0, which is 2. And 1, just 1. 27 is 11011, so this becomes top is 3, right? And the bottom is 3. And so 31 becomes the top is 3 and the bottom is 7. So now, now that you have it broken into the decoder, you just do AND gates, you just do... Uh, Did you break it up like that because we knew that we would be using that two input AND gate? Bingo. Okay. Exactly right, yes? Uh, should it be like, on the first decoder it should be... C, D, E, and the second one should be A, B. Yeah, you're correct. This should be, this should be A, the way I have it up here, B, and then C, D, and E. That's the correct notation. So from there, it's just going, all right, 0 and 1, 0 and 6, 1 and 4, 2 and 1, 3 and 3, 3 and 7. And then you just used OR gates from there. Does that make sense? So now you can significantly simplify the complexity of your design, I mean, of your code. And you said we used the two sets because we knew we were going to be using different uh, angles. Right. So what it, let's say, and this isn't the type of thing I would ever ask you because it's a little too complex on an exam or anything like this. But let's say I had something that went out all the way to, and the last midterm was 63. So how many bits do I need to uh, convey 63? Right, so what's, what's 2 to the 7 is 128, right? So 2 to the 6 is 64? Yeah. Right, so we need 6 bits. So now, Let's say, well, let's say, let's do a seven bit, right? I have a seven bit value, that's in the last min term is 127. And I've limited you to three to eight decoders because I am sadistic, right? That's supposed to be a joke. Laugh, laugh. No, um, but 
what you can do is you can break it down into three bits, three bits, and a one bit where it's just having zero or one as your third three to eight decoder. Or you could have a three to eight decoder and a four to sixteen decoder. And that would that would do it. When we're going like that, you didn't put like the zeros just to say we're out a three to eight decoder for like one in Oh no, the reason why I don't have the zeros there is because none of the are you talking about this one right here? Yeah. The only values that I have are the only values that were needed on the bottom side. So one six, four, one three seven. Oh yeah, because you're never going to. Yeah, if you assume it's a zero, that's fine. So I put so I had A and B going into the three input decoder, and from there the other values just tied to zero. Mm -hmm. That's a good question because you're going to, that's something that you'll, if you if you recall from logic design, remember having to like tie pins to ground in BDD? Yes? No? Okay, so if you have a chip and sometimes you're going to, in order to have it do its proper logical operation, sometimes in order to have the proper digital design, you actually have to tie certain pins to ground or BDD to ensure, just like you were saying, that every single time this last bit is zero, or last every single time the bit is one. Does that make sense? Sometimes you need to do that. Not always. So why did you run an extension like that? What do you mean? Uh, he was showing some sort of notation. What notation? For this example. What, what 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 notation are you talking about? I don't know. You ran a different notation. Oh, because I I made a mistake. Yeah, no, it should be, it should be, it, uh, I'll write it again. This should be, these should match, this should be A, B, C, D, and E. I, I, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's what he was saying. And then the, uh, I think I might have had one other example down here where I was just showing up uh, the design of a priority encoder where the input priority, they switched it around. So, here, it's D3, D0, come on, D1 and D2. So if it was D3, D2, D1, and D0, it would be 1, 1, 1, and then this would be X, and this would be X, right? And this would be 0 and 0. But we've changed the priorities, so it all looks this way. Now, based on these outputs, this became the logic we designed, right? And here is the final result. So when do you think a priority encoder would be a good idea? Yes, on the lecture you added a... Uh, right, okay, okay, so the reason I did that on the lecture is because, um, and this would be, I would accept this, is, this circuit is full credit. Uh, the reason I added it is because, and I believe I did it, here I had D or D0 or D3. So I added another one where I had D0 or D3. And the reason why is if you if you assume I didn't I didn't put in the problem that um, you had to assume that you could potentially get incorrect values, like if you got more than one value as an input of one. If if it if I just stated it like this, this this is a perfectly valid circuit. You if you put in if you only put in one value of one at any given moment, like it's supposed to work, this circuit will work fine. I added an additional OR gate to do error checking. So, so if you had one and if you had one one zero zero, it would give you it, it wouldn't overload. It would still give the correct priority. Because if you had a D three and a D two as both one, which one would you want on the output based on this condition? D three. D three. So if you had if you had D0 and D2 as ones, which one would you want? D0. So. Does that make sense? If I had multiple values of one, right? Mm. So here we've designed it. I take it from the <laughs> example from the textbook. What's happened is they've had values of one. I have don't cares. 
because I want this value to be 1. Yeah. Because if I had a 1 here, I don't care because I my priority is D3. Does that make sense now? Okay. So that was the end of section. It might. was the D2 when I had 1. It was the lowest priority, so that's why everything else is 0. Yeah, D2 is the lowest priority. So it's going to have a 0, 0 on the output. So there's no D2. See how there's no D2 input here? Right. Because if D2 is 1, it would just be like, uh, just have them as zeros. And the reason we call it encoder is it's taking four inputs we want and making an encoding that says, okay, so this is 1, 1, then I know it's D3. If it's 1, 0, basically, let me scroll up just a little bit so I can show you the priorities while I'm saying this. If it's 1, 0, it's going to represent D0. If it's D1, it's going to represent, <coughs> it's going to be 0, 1. And D2, it's going to be 0, 0. Well, so sometimes if you're propagating multiple signals, along and you're trying to do some sort of encoding for security purposes, you can come up, I mean, this is a very simple example, but you can actually use it to select and communication, especially this works a lot in um, fiber optic cables, where you have a, a binary value being passed along, but you also have an encoding. So if you were saying that this value is supposed to come from HBO, right? And HBO has a specific encoding channel, you're getting a binary value that this is going to be what's on the TV, but they have to select HBO in order to actually do it on the channel. If they switch their channel, then if you switch the encoding, at which point it gives you a second, a different set of values, right? At which point that's what you're going to get to your TV. So this is an example of how you would so that putting the encoding on the TV instead of the <laughs> That's exactly how it's done. <laughs> that's exactly what they did. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that was the end of... Section two. Um, for section three, um, I had this quote from Thomas Hobbes. Uh, by ratiocination, I mean computation. And this is, he, by the way, I should say that he said this in 1656. Now, to compute it is either to collect the sum of many things that are added together, or to know what remains when one is taken, one thing is taken out of another. And any man add multiplication and division, I will not be against it. Seeing multiplication is nothing but addition equals to one to another, and division nothing but subtraction of equals one from another as often as possible. So all that ratio sonation is comprehended in these two operations is the mind addition and subtraction. So this is 1656, and Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher, is talking about basically arithmetic logic units. How do you use um, code to uh, how to use common <laughs> algorithms to perform tasks. Now, how would you take what he was just talking about and apply that to the design of an advanced digital system? What are some of the, what's that? Make it as simple as possible. Yep, make the common case back simple as smaller as faster, right? That's all he's saying. So instead of, so we're talking about risk versus CISC. Um, Sometimes you would design specific algorithms at the compiler level, since MIPS is a compiler driven encoding of the micro engine, to use it addition and subtraction or bit shifting in order to perform multiplication and division faster than and with less area than having to design a full multiplier, right? Does that make sense? So going further on, so we the basic idea of an arithmetic logic unit is we have our you guys recall uh, machine instructions? Go ahead. There we go. So we had this machine instruction, and the whole idea is we're adding these two values and storing it in this register. And so we have our control unit, which has our control values, which tells us what the operation is. We have our input registers. That ties to this. So our flags, we're going to talk about overflow here in a minute and comparisons and your output registers and this ties to that specific register so now this is the value that we're sending to the control unit this is what's known as the opcode you guys re uh, recall I was loading to that earlier 
And these allude to the three different registers. And so I can tell you that this is an, what's known as an R-type instruction or a register-type instruction. This is the shift amount, and since it's zero, we're not shifting anything at all. And this is the function, which is differentiating the specific type of R-type instruction from addition. So that's taking everything found from I've done something in C or Java where I said A plus B, or C equals A plus B, right? It compiles it down to machine instruction. Machine instruction is then <coughs> translated to binary. And then it is put into the data path, into your advanced digital, digital system. And so MIPS, as we've talked about a little earlier, uses 32-bit values. Right? Come on, scroll. And so this is the representation of positive and negative in uh, basically what's known as positive and negative infinity in the values. So the most significant bit here, this value, is the, the sign bit. If it's zero, that means it's a positive number. And if it's one, that means it's a negative number, right? And so this value, zero and then 131s, is equivalent to two to the 31st minus one. And then one, and then all zeros, is equivalent to negative two to the 31st. Yes? So, uh, go back up for just a second, back to your, to your diagram. Mm -hmm. So, if that um, number right there, would that be an entire thing, or would those be separate numbers that were passed? To ah, okay. Uh, there's a, there's going to be a little bit of the I believe button here for a minute, but the idea is that this 5-bit register, this 5-bit value, we have 32 registers in MIPS, and each of those registers contains a 32-bit value, which corresponds to what we were just talking about. Okay. So this tells me... If I have a 30... Since you guys just were working on the assignment, if I have a 5-bit value, and I'm trying to differentiate between 32 separate registers... What type of structure would I want to be able to take this value and tell me which one I need? What type? Specifically. Well, not, think about your assignment. What did you, something you guys did on your assignment, or have you gotten to this part yet? You might not have gotten to this point yet. Okay. 5 to 32 decoder? Okay, yeah. So I am going to decode a 5-bit value into a 32-bit <coughs> signal, and then pick that. This allows me to pick one oh, to which I'm going to either read or write. At which point, that is going to consist of, when we get into section 4, we start talking about sequential units. 32 bits of SRAM is going to store a 32-bit value, at which point it, that value is going to be sent to the arithmetic logic unit. And it's going to be represented in this way. Yes? Why is it uh, x86 if it's a 32-bit system? This is not x86. This is MIPS. Right. What is that? Thing? MIPS is a reduced instruction set computer that we're going to be talking about in this course. Okay. So x86 is familiar. Yeah. Mm, x86 is different entirely. Okay. We recall from the TGOs before about how MIPS is a reduced instruction set computer that's a compiler driven encoding of the micro engine. That's what we're talking about. So studying x86 in this course would be a little overwhelming. I th actually, it would definitely be. Yeah, that would, you would not want me to throw you into that kind of fire at this level. Um, I mean, that's just that's just fair. You guys are sophomores and juniors, right? Like you're you're going to somebody just throw you into the twenty foot it would, you don't know how to swim yet. That's MIPS will accomplish what you need to learn. It's 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 difficult, but once you get through there, then you move on to x86 and the ARM architectures and everything else. So. Is it kind of like how they make stuff in Java, even though it's kind of pointless? What's that? It's like kind of how they make it for Java, even though it's kind of pointless. Well, Java, I mean. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say Java is kind of pointless. I mean, you have the virtu basically every virtual machine is runs off the Java virtual machine, um, but there are other different there are other programming languages. Java. The other reason that we teach Java is because Java involves something called garbage collection. Are you familiar with the idea of garbage collection? So 
you have it, we're going to be learning about memory accesses and something called pointers. Java, you don't really have to worry about that too much because right now they're just trying to teach you the fundamentals of coding. And if you don't understand memory management, then teaching C, C++ can be. But when I was out in uh, I was out in San Francisco three years ago, and I got to hear Ken Thompson talk. Do you guys know who Ken Thompson is? Basically, he was the guy who invented Unix. Him and uh, Dan, uh, Richie. He just died, didn't he? Oh, Richie just passed away. Ken Tom No. Oh, I'm sorry. Dennis Richie is who I heard talk. Ken Thompson just passed away. Yeah. So Dennis, the uh, and so we was at a panel, and somebody asked him if Alan Turing were alive today, what would he think of modern computing? And Dennis Richie said. Uh, that if he were alive and he saw C++, it would be the equivalent if the inventor of the TV were alive today and saw Maury Povich on there. <laughs> or the Kardashians. i gotta go, got to go this kind of age group, right? Like, Maury Povich is that. I'm like, yes, people have forgotten who that man is. Um, okay, or seeing the Kardashians or reality TV, it's, it's an ugly, ugly language, and everybody applauded. So that's the point. So that's why you, you learn Java, because it's a little... Simpler to teach at that level. Okay, so as an example, I've kind of given this little subtract six from seven using MIPS. So we aren't going to the architecture level, but we have this what's known as sign extension. Are you, are you guys familiar with this? We perform the two's complement of six. So six was you know one one zero, and we'll add another significant bit, and so you change them all one zero. 0, 1, and then you add 1, and it becomes 1, 0, 1, 0. So that becomes negative 6, like we have here. And then sign extension is just adding 1s to it. So, <coughs> so then what happens is if you have 7, you just add them together, this becomes 1. Subtracting it becomes the same as adding these. Uh, and then you get carry, 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 right? And then it just becomes all zeros. So now we have seven minus six, which is the same thing as seven plus negative six. Is so the overflow the right, and that's what we're going to talk about here. The overflow is possible. So in the next overflow occurs when the results of the operand cannot be represented with the available hardware. So talking about what you were talking about, yeah, this one that carries over, mm -hmm. but what's going to happen is because of the fact that seven minus six, that one is just kind of floating out there. But we have the in the 32-bit value that we have, it's correct. And the reason why it's correct, coming back to that most significant bit, the most significant bit is zero. Since the most significant bit didn't change, that's where, therefore, the overflow didn't occur. If you have the most significant bit change, like I'm going to show you an example here in a second. Okay, well, that's that. Okay, um, we have, if, you, if it changes, then you have overflow. And you can only have, it's only possible uh, when you're adding operands of the same sign or subtracting values of the different sign. So if you had 2 to 31 plus 2 to 31, right, that's going to be all ones out to here and all ones out to here, right? then you're going to definitely get overflow. You're going to change that bit. Same thing if you add 1, 1. Let's say if you're subtracting 2 to the negative 31 from 2 to the negative 31. S1, 0, all the way down here, right? You're going to add these, and what's this going to become? 0, and then you're going to get an overflow bit, right? So now you have 2 to the negative 31 minus... I'm sorry, negative 2 to 31 minus negative 2 to 31, and you get 0. That's overflow. I remember how we dealt with this before. I think we uh, added more bits in the uh, previous one, I think. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you can't add more bits? What happens when you have a computer architecture where you've designed? What's up? I'm just saying, even if you add one more, it just starts shitting bits. <laughs> That's a technical term. <laughs> okay, so it 
continues to create bits. <laughs> but yeah, that, that eventually it would, it'll still continue to overflow because of the sign extension. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have to do flags. You're right. And if we get this far in the course, I'll be able to discuss specifically what happens when you have a data path and you generate overflow. What's going to, I briefly allude to it here, uh, where I talk about the, uh, yeah, so I want to go to this problem. So basically the whole idea is that you have, we have this problem, and then here I talk about specific registers where we store values from what we're going to uh, do. So we have this, uh, the error pro exception program counter. We have the exact time in the location in the code where our error occurred. And we're going to have a specific, what time is it? 10.30. So we have a specific location where it's going to occur, and then we're going to discuss what it was. So we might have an arithmetic <laughs> overflow or a controller error, meaning there was an unknown instruction. And so those two values are going to have hex values. So if you've ever had the blue screen of death, so like if you're running Xilinx on Windows 8, um, and you see an error message and it gives you a big hex value and the second big hex value, what those are telling you is that this is your error, this is where it occurred in the instruction, and this is what happened. In the meantime, let's go back to addition. <laughs> um, so if I add one here, right? So I have 2 to the negative 31. And so that should be a 1 there. I'm sorry. This is 1 plus 2 to the negative 2 to the 31 minus 1, right? So here's our so I've added it and we get all these carry values and look, we have overflow. So we have So what you would do if you wanted to check for this is you would do some use something called a comparator, which we'll discuss in this section. So you get your most significant bits. You do zero and zero, right? If you have zero and zero, that means you're adding two positive numbers, right? That means that you shouldn't have a one on the output. So if you compare them and you and then you expect a zero, and then the most significant bit from your ALU becomes a one, and they're they're not equal, throw a flag. That's how you would do that at the architecture level. Does that make sense? That's how you would address it to address your question about what happens when you're fixed at 32 like MIPS is. And the exceptions are what ha are, are known as unscheduled events that disrupt program flow. So you have an overflow. Let's say we've had, we have this, we've added this, we put this problem in here, 2 to 31. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> this construction sucks. I can't disagree. Um, we have the, somebody has put this problem into the architecture, and we get this result, right? Well, now we can no longer properly represent it with the architecture. But if you have bad values, you don't want the code to continue, right? So we have to do something called an exception, where we stop the code and explain what happened. We are stopping the code because this line of code produced an arithmetic overflow. And so I list these types of instructions here. Add instructions, add immediate, and subtraction. Uh, does, I, I've talked about add immediate before. What is an add immediate instruction? What's the difference between add instruction and add immediate? Would an add instruction just put it at the end of all your code? No. Okay. Well, I, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to see what immediate means. So the immediate instruction means that it has some constant value. So it's just an add instruction is C equals A plus B. And the add immediate is C equals A plus 5. And you have subtract. Now, why do I not have a subtract instruction? Subtract or subtract immediate instruction? Because <coughs> addition is just the subtract is the addition of bingo. Bingo. 
So I would just have, and what would I have performed that my two's complement? What could I have to do that? It's a something driven encoding of the micro engine. I've said it, I've actually said it three times in class today with a TGO. MIPS is a what driven encoding of the micro engine? Compiler. compiler driven encoding of the micro engine. So the compiler level is going to just do two's complement of the number and then put it into the architecture. And so that allows us to have one less control, that allows us to reduce the size of the control unit. So now we've made it smaller, it costs less. And so I want to go over uh, one more thing with you guys before I discuss uh, specific things with VHDL, specifically this idea of IEEE 754 <laughs> format. Um, what happens when I want to represent numbers that are bigger than 2 to the 31? This is essentially the equivalent of scientific notation in binary. And so it's a 32-bit value. And so the first bit is what's known as the sign bit. As we discussed before, 0 is positive and 1 is negative. And the next 8 bits, which are these here, are what are known as the exponent. So in this equation right here, that relates to E. And this equation is, is E to the negative 127. So here I have 8 bits. So what's the biggest number I, re I what's this what's this biggest number I can represent here? If I have eight ones, no. One more up. Two fifty five, right? So if I have zero here. So that's, this value here is going to go into this equation. So if I have 255, what's my, what's my exponent there? What's 155? What's, what's 255 minus 127? 128. And so what's 0 minus 127? Negative 127. So what is my range of my exponents? No. Gross conceptual error. What were the two values we just calculated? Negative 127 to what? To 128. That's correct. Do not say zero because that's our representation using this equation. So that's what's our offset. So we can use this IEEE 754 format to represent positive exponents and negative exponents. All in binary. And so the last three bits are is what's known as the mantissa. And that's just the actual number. So if you had 3.4 times 10 to the 23rd, 23rd is your exponent, and you would have a, uh, your mantissa would be 0.27. So what this means is 1 plus the mantissa <coughs> represents 1.0 times 2 to the something, right? So in this case, what we can calculate, we, we have this number here. It's positive. This is zero, right? So it becomes one plus the mantissa. So it's 1.0 times two to the what? What's this number here? 255. And so what, what becomes my exponent? What's my exponent going to be? 128, right? And the reason I was able to do that is because it's 128 is equal to 255 minus 127. And so 2 to the 128, and I can, uh, I'm not, let's make the TGOs 3.1 through 3.6 for the homework because I want to show you something really quick in VHDL. And so 2 to the 128. <laughs> is positive infinity, and negative 2 to the 128 is negative infinity. Does that make sense? That's the representation in uh, binary. So before we head out, 
um, I want to show you an example here. So I've designed a 4-bit adder. And I've based this design off of a 1-bit adder, which we'll be going over next class, as well as XOR gates. And um, and this is my this is my VHDL design, and my test bench. I inserted some loops here. So this is what I want to talk about. How do we initialize this? So what I've done is let me find where it is in my code. So you, there's a one bit adder. Woohoo! So the concept that we go over here is that you can use XOR gates to just have one signal where zero is addition and one is subtraction. We'll prove that next class. And so based on that, I've done my code. And this is what's this is the arc the architecture in the VHDL. This, what you're looking at, these, I used to do these things all the time when I was working on projects where these are all timing. So I have for a four bit adder four inputs. B0, A0, B1, A1, B2, A2, B3, A3. And I have designed a full adder. And I know that my full adder has a delay of 15 nanoseconds. <laughs> and if you properly design it, yours will too. So you're going to have carries. You're going to carry to the next full adder. And this is going to be your out. These are your outputs here, right? And so you're going to want all four bits of your sum to come out at the same time and your carry to come out at the same time, right? So you're going to have to ensure that your timing is proper. So I would say, all right, I know that I have to use this XOR to determine whether or not to add or sub, and I know my XOR gate has a delay of 5 nanoseconds, right? So I have 5 nanosecond delay. And I want all three inputs into my full adder to have that same five nanosecond delay. So I have a five, see I have this five nanosecond delay here and this five nanosecond delay here. Mm -hmm. And then I know five plus 15 is 20. So my outputs here, this value comes available at 20. So I want this available at 20, right? So A is not gonna be stopped. So what's, what's the delay I'm gonna enter? 20. What's the delay for B? I'm going to have an XOR gate, which is how many seconds? Five nanoseconds. So 20 minus 15, 20 minus 5 is 15, right? And so forth. And you're going to keep calculating it. So um, now we have these primitive blocks that we're building up, and I'm inserting delays. So if I, you know, one of the assignments I'm giving you is to do a 32 bit ALU. I mean, sorry, a 32 bit adder. This would be a pain in the butt to do to calculate this out 32 times, right? So, what would I want to do instead? How could I how could I uh, reduce if I were to design this as a four bit adder, and I have this as a block? Mm -hmm. So I can make it four to eight, right? And then I just delay. If I know that this is going to come out. It's going to take 45 plus 15. So I know my outputs are going to be at 60, right? This is why I'm telling you to keep track of the delay for the outputs. If I know this is my delay of 60, I'm going to have these output. Then I can just say, have my next four bits wait 60 nanoseconds. How much would I want my next four bits to wait? Bingo. And then from there, you just have all your inputs wait, have it into the input. Instead of having to do this every time, now you use these primitive blocks to significantly reduce the amount of coding you do. And then you would just make have your buffers on the outputs to ensure that they all come out at the same time. Yes? So this is really the biggest problem that we had. When you have, you've got B and A there. And mm -hmm. you say you left those inputs as B and A, and then you started stacking those those units on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And you wanted a single input of just a 32-bit. How, you know, using the vectors, how are you going to... And you, and you did I, because those are A and B. And mm. you wanted an I input vectored all the way from 31 down to... No, no, no. Okay, so this is... Okay, I see what you're saying. So you're talking about I here? No, I mean, in, when you... For your 32-bit adder... Right. When, you, when you're when you calling the inputs for those. Okay, so... Input. So what you can do is you can just... So my inputs to the full adders down here, I have... B at 
value zero. Yeah, so now I am matched. So what you're going to do is when you get to the block levels, you're going to be mapping four bits of the vector to the input for the full adder. So now, let's say I was, let's say I was designing an 8-bit adder using two 4-bit four, four adders, right? I would create, I would use the add sub 4-bit as, as a component, right, within the 8-bit. And that would map, and then in the next level, I have 7 down to 0, and then 7 down to 0 for a sum. So that would take A7 to 4 and map it to one of the adders, and then B7 to 4 and map it to the adder. And that would map 3 down to 0 to the second adder, and 3 down to 0 to the second adder, and then connect them using the carry bit. So the last thing I wanted to hit, because we're almost done with class, um, using loops and test benches. <coughs> so here's what I have done. I have created this 4-bit adder. And as I'm sure many of you found and looked up, you can instantiate vectors in a test bench in this way, right? So I initialize waiting for a clock period. Now, as long as the variab this variable is just there to count, as long as it doesn't match any of the variables in your component, it's fine. You can use whatever. Just as long as it doesn't, like if I did I here, that would be a problem as well, right? So here I'm looping from 0 to 15, and I'm actually incrementing b by 1, right? And then, so this goes from 0 to 15, and as we just found out from, uh, from uh, overflow, this will actually just go back to 0, 0. And then this will just, so this tells us to me to do a test where I'm doing all possible outcomes. So it's 15 times 15, so 225. And then I want to do process properties. So I've just, okay. And then simulate. And then it didn't crash on me. That's good. And so now these are our outputs. These are, I'm sorry, those, well, these are our inputs, right? And this is kind of comparing it. It's, it's actually really small at this point, but if it was bigger, you could actually see the numbers. And then based on sum, I can see the sum values. And then carry out, you can see how it's changing, how the carry out value changes. And if we zo zoom in on a certain part, you can see that the output, all the output signals are um, at the, have properly, let me get Epic Pen back up here. There you, there you go. See how they're all coming out at the same point and that there's a delay from the input as well? <laughs> if it actually decides to write. Come on. So there's a delay here or not. Oh, there we go. Woo Success. So that's our delay. So that's that's what you're going to want to do for when you figure things out. Like this is a little further ahead of where um, we're expecting to be. I'm going to dismiss you after I make this point. Um, I'm going to want you to keep track of that because the what I found is in projects, if I were to just throw little things at you and then have a final project where people get in a lot of trouble is they spend hours and hours and hours at the end of the semester fix, trying to fix a minor timing error because they can't find it. So I'm trying to build that fundamental. That's why I'm designing the assignments this way. Um, 3.1 through 3.6, I know it's brutal, but uh, the, but that'll be, um, uh, you guys will be working on the project, which is due on Wednesday, tomorrow night at midnight. Um, and I had one other thing I wanted to say. Oh yeah, exam review. We'll be doing some exam review on Thursday. I'll have, I'll know what, uh, precisely. So, you and I didn't have it. So what's? Come on, I gotta stop this. Yeah, yeah.